Psalm 84, 4 and 5b say, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you.
Crossroads family, good to connect again over God's word, and I'm going to encourage you to take out your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 2. I'm excited to dive into the scriptures with all of you today. We're going to tackle this whole chapter. Now, here's the deal. There's so much in this chapter. There's no way that I can do this text justice in the 30 minutes or so that we have today. So I'm going to ask you to read it on your own diligently. Uh, read it several times. I mean, uh, I've been studying this passage all week and just diving in deep, and it's amazing to me the treasures that are here. In my family, if we've got a lot going on in the course of a day or a week, you know, we have this saying and we'll just be like, it's just a lot. And we'll say it like that. It's just a lot. Well, here's the deal with Romans chapter two. It's just a lot. And so I have tried to do my best to create an outline that's going to bring some kind of order to this that's easy for you to understand. And so I wanna encourage you again to access the bulletin that we have on our website, and you can download that in a, in a PDF and just kind of uh, follow along as we go. Because I know that I've found in my own study, it's good to have a structure and an outline that we can work from, just because there is so much in this letter to the church in Rome. And it's so deep and it's so thick 
that we want to try and glean as much as we possibly can. And so today I'm going to unpack Romans 2, looking specifically at two big umbrella themes, all right? One of them is self-righteousness, and the other one is God's judgment. Our self-righteousness and God's judgment. Here's the deal. Nobody likes to be excluded and left out from a group that they really want to be a part of. We all have this longing inside of our hearts to belong and to be in relationship and fellowship with people. And in the Roman house churches that consisted of both Gentiles and Jews, there was a tendency for various reasons for the Jewish Christians to look down on the Gentiles with an attitude of superiority and self-righteousness. In other words, some of the Jewish believers were thinking that they were, quite honestly, better than their brothers and sisters who were from the Gentile background. And I want you to think about Crossroads as a church family, and I want you to think about our corporate worship. And if people came with that kind of attitude of superiority and demonstrate that in their per interpersonal relationships, what would that do for our fellowship? And here's the reality. All of us struggle at some level with feeling self-righteous at times, but nobody likes to be on the receiving end of that. When I was in fourth grade, like in the middle of my fourth grade year, my family moved from a city called Rockford, Illinois, which is in Northern Illinois, to a city called Oak Park, which is just west of the city of Chicago. And so this transition came about because of my dad's job. And if you've ever transitioned as a student in the middle of a year, you know it can be kind of stressful and anxiety producing. And it was for me as a fourth grader. And I remember going to school that first day with my mom and we walked into the school and the first place we went was the principal's office, not because I was in trouble, but because we were gonna get a brief orientation. And so we sat in the principal's office and we talked to him for a while, and then he led us down this corridor, a very long corridor, to the dreaded door of my fourth grade classroom. And I'll never forget when that door opened and all of the eyes of the students in that classroom just peered at the doorway and locked eyes with mine. And there was this self-righteous, judgmental, condescending look, at least I thought at that point in time, from all of these students. And their glare was like, who is this kid? Who does he think he is trying to get into this classroom? If looks could indeed kill, I would no longer be living right now. Let's just put it that way. I was being evaluated and scrutinized and inspected and judged based solely on my outward appearance and the simple fact that up until that point in time, I was an outsider. I was not considered a legitimate part of that class. And I sensed in the stares of those classmates a pretty profound attitude of self-righteousness. Most of us can probably think of a scenario that we've been through in our lives similar to my situation in fourth grade. It's never fun. It's never something that we relish feeling like an outsider. In Romans 2, the chapter that we're tackling today, Paul speaks to some of the Jewish Christians within these Roman house churches. And he literally calls them out on their self-righteous attitude towards some of these Gentile believers. Last week, we studied the second half of Romans chapter one, which graphically depicts to us the effects of sin in our lives. And it reveals the effects of unbelief, of refusing Jesus Christ as Savior, King, and Lord. And when people choose to reject God, there is that downward spiral of the degrading effects of sin that are made known in our lives. In Paul's mind, he could envision Jewish church members, as he was thinking about this church in Rome, welling up with pride and thinking that Paul's words in chapter 1 about these 
effects of sin were not really meant for them. In other words, some of these Jewish believers were probably thinking, oh, those are just for the Gentiles. Those are people who are outside of the Jewish race. So in chapter 2, Paul wants to address that very self-righteous attitude. And I believe that one of the reasons Paul wanted to address this very early on in his letter is because Paul himself could remember struggling with those very same feelings of self-righteousness prior to his conversion on the Damascus Road. In fact, I want to read a few verses from Philippians chapter 3. This is Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. And he writes this, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, in other words, confidence in their Jewish heritage, I have more, Paul says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But, Paul goes on to write, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. You know, what Paul is really trying to do in Romans chapters 1 and 2 is lead both Gentiles and Jews to a place of utter brokenness before the Lord, where there is a realization of sinfulness in hearts so that there is this repentance of sin and a turning to Christ in faith. So in a sense, Romans chapter 1 is kind of dealing with um, Gentiles, and then Romans 2 dealing with the Jewish people, and then Romans 3 is going to bring us to the place where Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul wants the Jews in our text today to realize their need for repentance and putting their faith in Christ, just like the Gentiles were called to repent and respond in faith. However, here's the deal. Many of the Jewish believers struggled with their self-righteousness for several key reasons, and I would like to highlight a few of them right now. Number one, the Jewish people often relied on the possession of the law of God or the Torah as giving them a unique standing before God. In other words, in their minds, they are the privileged people. And because of that, it doesn't necessarily matter what they do. They're not going to experience God's judgment in the future because they are God's chosen and elect people. They have the law. They have the Torah. Secondly, these Jews in the church in Rome considered themselves to be God's favorites because they were the elect. So they had the possession of the law of God. They had the Torah. Because of their election, they were the favorites. And God is never going never gonna to cast judgment on the favorites, right? And then thirdly, they prided themselves on being able to make superior moral judgments in contrast to the Gentiles. So I want you to put all of this together and think about Jewish Christians worshiping alongside Gentile believers. And I want you to think about these Jewish Christians having these condescending, self-righteous attitudes towards those that are sitting right next to them in the chairs. In our auditorium, we got blue chairs, right? So we can think about, in our own context, what if we came to worship and we were looking down on the brothers and sisters sitting next to us because we felt morally superior to them? We were looking down on them and we thought, you know what? Over the past week, I have made better decisions than these other people. I am in a closer place with the Lord. I am at a greater standing with Christ simply because of my moral superiority. Can you imagine how the deep fellowship of the church would be fractured and would become... Um, very dysfunctional. That's what Paul is concerned about here as he's writing to the church in Rome. And all of this self-righteous thinking is really what Jesus talks about in one of his parables. 
I want you to write down Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Luke 18, 9 through 14. Jesus tells the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Jewish Christians in Rome were acting like Pharisees. And the Gentile believers could kind of be considered the tax collectors. And Jesus says this in Luke 18. Luke writes, To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to the heavens, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Paul wants Jews and Gentiles in the church of Rome to have broken hearts, humble hearts before the Lord, so that they can worship together in unity. And just as Jesus talks about the self-righteous Pharisee in that parable. Some of the Jews were probably looking at that list of sins in Romans chapter one and saying, you know what? Gentiles do those things, but I would never do anything like that. But if you look again at Romans one verses 29 through 30, which are verses that we looked at last week, Paul brings it all down to a place of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity. Envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice, gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. People who are inventing ways of doing evil. The laundry list of sins in Romans chapter 1 is like this huge receptacle that captures everybody, for we all have sinned. And yet there were still some self-righteous people in the church in Rome that were saying, not me, not me at all. Um, and so I want to highlight now, as we begin to look into our text, um, some of the symptoms of self-righteousness that Paul highlights in Romans chapter 2. Now, I need to let you know that we're not going to read all of the chapter right now, just kind of going through it all. I'm going to leave that up to you uh, this week in your quiet time, your devotional time, and continue to work through those Roman study books that many of you have. Um, but I'm going to be highlighting sections of this chapter as they support the points that I am going to make. So we're going to look at three symptoms of self-righteousness. You know, with COVID right now, um, all over the news, a lot of times I'll go and look at the news and there will be articles about, you know, the top 10 symptoms of COVID-19 or the top three symptoms of COVID. Well, today I'm going to give you the top three symptoms of self-righteousness. And these are heart check issues for us. These are things that we need to assess for ourselves. What I do not want, once again, out of our teaching today is for us to read scripture and think about other people and how badly they're falling short of the glory of God. I want us to think about our lives and allow the Holy Spirit of God to search our hearts. So here we go. Symptom number one of self-righteousness is a critical spirit. It's a critical spirit. Look at verse one of chapter two. Paul writes, you therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment and do the same things. When Paul talks about passing judgment on someone else, he's talking about condemning them for their sins. And so there's a critical spirit, a critical condemning spirit that comes in the form of passing judgment. So some of the Jewish Christians believed that they were exempt from any judgment of God simply because they were Jews. They were a part of the in-group, just like my fourth grade class thought that they were the in-group and I was the out outlier. 
And so for the Jewish people in this church, there was the tendency to think that the Gentiles were on the outside and only they would be held accountable to God for their actions. They felt privileged and they felt entitled because of their Jewish heritage. Uh, my family was on vacation this past summer and we rented a place on the beach in Southwest Florida. And it was a part of a condo complex. And so many of these condominiums are owned by people who spend time there in the summer. Some don't go there in the summer, but we were there in the summer and we were renting one of these condos. And so I was on the beach in a chair and just kind of enjoying the sun and the surf and I had a fishing pole in the water. And someone came up to me and they were obviously uh, an owner of one of the condos, but they just came up to me and they didn't introduce themselves at all to me. They just said, I don't think that's your chair. And I told them, well, I'm renting one of these condos. And they basically told me, it doesn't matter, that, that chair is mine. And I was startled and taken aback by all of this, but I gave up my chair and went and found another one. But if you've ever been in a situation like that, you know that it can be a hurtful experience. Someone coming and basically saying something or doing something that leaves you in a really tough spot. You know, I've heard of people walking into churches and telling visitors to get out of their chair. What are you doing in my seat? And there's this critical, condemning, self-righteous attitude that can come over us and we can do a lot of damage with that. So may that never be the case here at Crossroads for people to, uh, to take up residence in a chair and never wanna give that up, right? We need to be people who are willing to give up our seat to the visitor, to be looking out for people who need a seat. But that wasn't happening in the church in Rome. And so Paul is issuing this corrective and he's hoping that these Jewish believers get his point. Um, the second symptom of self-righteousness is a hypocritical life. So number one is a critical spirit. Number two is a hypocritical life. Look again at verse one, where Paul says, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. So the Jewish believers were getting upset at the Gentiles, but they were, Paul said, doing the same things that the Gentiles were doing. In order to get more of this argument, I need you to go to verse 17. Verse 17 of chapter 2. Here we go. This is a longer section, 17 through 24. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, Paul writes, if you rely on the law and boast in God, which is what they were doing, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. In other words, that's a quote from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. And because of the way the people of Israel were living back then, they were giving God a bad name. And it says God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The Gentiles were saying bad things about the Jews because the Jews weren't watching how they lived. They were living a hypocritical life. Over the past year, as I've been watching the news, I've been startled and saddened to read about all of these big, prominent Christian leaders who have fallen because of their sin. And another one just happened a, a few weeks ago. And I have to check my spirit every time I read one of those articles to not go into a self-righteous mode and start casting judgment. To be sure we know the, 
when people fall into those types of situations that what they have done is indeed sin. And we need to call sin for what it is. But we need to be very careful to not put ourselves in a morally superior place over those individuals who have fallen, but to recognize our own vulnerability to sin. Paul is trying to communicate to these Gentile, or excuse me, to these Jewish Christians, their need to humble themselves in the presence of Christ and to receive the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness and love that's only found in Jesus. And so they were once again, probably looking at that list in Romans one and saying, I would never, do anything like that. I haven't committed adultery, but in the background of Paul's teaching is the teaching of Jesus. Specifically, we can go to Jesus's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters five through seven. And part of that, Jesus says this, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus presses into the interior part of our lives to our hearts. We may think about murder as an outward act, and surely it is at one level, but Jesus brings it to the interior and says, if you are angry and bitter and wrathful towards a brother or sister, you will be subject to judgment because it's as if you are murdering that person in your heart. Jesus goes on to say, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And some of these Jewish believers in Rome are probably thinking, I've never committed adultery. But Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Once again, pressing to the interior. Paul is pressing to the interior, helping the people to realize the condition of their hearts. And so the second symptom of self-righteousness is a hypocritical life not doing that self-assessment that is necessary for us to walk closely with the Lord, but always just casting judgment on those who fall around us. And third, the third symptom of a self-righteous attitude is a hardened heart. Look at verses three through five of Romans two. And like I said, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, supporting the argument from the text. Verse three, so when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Verse five, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart or hardened heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. So if you go back to verses three and four, we note that the Jewish believers were taking their standing with the Lord for granted. In other words, they were saying, because we are God's chosen people, we don't have to worry about God's judgment. Look at how kind he's been towards us. Look at how patience, patient he has been toward us. And Paul says, you need to realize that God has been kind and he's been patient so that you will be a people of repentance. God is kind and he's gracious so that we will actually be led to a place where we recognize our sinfulness and we humble ourselves in the face of the almighty God and we repent. There was a religious spirit. A hardened heart comes alongside a religious spirit. Some of the most angry, bitter, and mean people are people who go to church every week, who are there every time the doors are open, and yet their heart is hard because they are um, living with a self-righteous attitude. They're stubborn and they are unrepentant. And all of us who love Jesus and follow Jesus must beware that we too can fall into a spirit of religiosity, of just going through the motions without a sincere heart connection 
with the living God whom we are serving. We must remember the context of this letter. Once again, it's read to multiple house churches of Jewish believers and Gentile believers who were struggling to work through their religious and cultural issues to be a unified body of Christ. Paul is wanting both groups to see the reality of their sinful hearts and their need to respond to Christ in faith and in repentance. In chapter 2, he also wants to tell the Jewish believers that just because they are Jews does not mean that they will avoid God's judgment. So in light of this other theme of God's judgment, let's now turn there, and I want to make two basic points on God's judgment. The first point is this, that God's judgment is based on our works. God's judgment is based on our works. Now, this may seem counterintuitive because we need to remember that we are saved by God's grace through faith. We are not saved because of our works. But if you remember back a couple lessons in the beginning of Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about faith. And he talks very clearly about the obedience that comes from faith. And one of the points we made is that faith leads to obedience. And so for Paul, genuine faith works itself out in works that are glorifying to Jesus Christ, words that glorify him, actions that glorify him. And so Paul wants to communicate to Jews and Gentiles alike that God's judgment is based on our works. Look at verse 6. It says, God will repay each person according to what they have done according to what they have done. You know, Paul, when he was coming to the end of his life, he wrote a letter, he wrote two letters to Timothy, one of his um, younger leaders in the church. And Paul was Timothy's mentor. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Paul wrote these words when he knows that his life is coming to an end. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In other words, we could say, that Paul's saying, I've been obedient. I have lived out this mission for Christ. I have been faithful to the gospel. And then Paul goes on to say, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, these rewards that he's talking about, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. So Paul connects the crown of righteousness, the reward that he will receive from the righteous judge. So there's the, the judgment of God that's implied into that. But it is a judgment that is based on what Paul has done with the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And we need to remember this as well. And there's deep motivation here for helping us to stay on track day in and day out when we keep in the forefront of our minds that God is going to judge us based on what we do with the truth that he has given us. And even because you are listening to this message right now, you are listening to God's word. And we know that we will be held accountable for what we know, for the truth that has been given to us. So when we have access to the scriptures, to the word of God, we know that God is going to hold us accountable for what we know. And there is a, a, a deep drive within that truth to help us stay focused on the Lord and to look forward to the reward that will come. Just like the Apostle Paul was looking forward to that award, the crown of righteousness. And we need to continue to fight the good fight. We need to look forward to finishing the race. We need to keep the faith. And so I want to use this uh, aspect of God's judgment as an encouragement to you. Maybe you've been feeling like throwing in the towel. You need to realize that God has so much more work for you to do. And every day is an opportunity to serve him. And that his judgment someday will be based on our works and how we take advantage of those opportunities that he presents to us. The second aspect of God's judgment that I want to highlight is this. God's judgment is just and impartial. God's judgment is just and impartial. Look at verse 11 of our text. This is a very important verse. You can memorize it right now. For God does not show favoritism. For God does not show favoritism. 
A broken and contrite heart God will never despise. He's looking for people who are hungry and thirsty for him. And so it will be a, a judgment for Jews and Gentiles alike, and it will be a perfectly just judgment. You know, as good as our justice system may be in this country, we know that it's uh it's definitely not perfect. There are so many things that could be improved. And yet God's judgment is perfect and will be perfect. God, Paul said that the Jews were given the law as a revelation of God's will. But in our text, he also says that the Gentiles were given a conscience to reveal right and wrong. And so people will be judged on the basis of what they know and what has been revealed to them. Um, look at verses 14 through 16. Paul writes, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. So Paul is saying, hey, there's this even playing field before the judgment seat of God. Gentiles will be judged based on the revelation that's been given to them and Jews will will be judged based on the revelation that will be given to them. And now I want to end. In view of all of this uh, truth about God's judgment, how are we called to live? And I just want to leave you with this word. We are called to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're called to live in the Spirit. We don't have time to read the rest of Romans chapter 2, but I want us to read verses 28 and 29. Because Paul ends this chapter with a reference to the Spirit. Paul writes, A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. Because the Jewish Christians were relying on the Torah and, the, and circumcision to make them exempt from God's judgment, Paul's saying, no, it's, it's an issue of your heart. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. As we continue our study of the book of Romans, we're going to get to Romans 8. And in Romans 8, Paul talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Paul's going to reveal to us through the Word of God that the Spirit gives life and sets us free from the law of sin and death. And I want to encourage all of you to continue to humbly come before the Lord each day, to ask him to fill you with the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit so that you can live in power and live in truth and that you can be empowered for the mission that God has for you. And it's also the indwelling spirit of God that will help us to remain humble in God's presence and to keep us from a self-righteous attitude that will be critical and hypocritical in our relationships with other people. God wants his church to be unified and the church of God is unified through the Holy Spirit. We are to maintain the unity of the body of Christ, and we do that by keeping in step with the Spirit of God. When we quench God's Spirit, we become full of ourselves instead of full of the power of Christ. When we quench God's Spirit, we start to look critically at other people, and we begin to feel morally superior to them, and we push them down as we begin to try and elevate ourselves. But Scripture's clear. When we humble ourselves in the presence of Christ, then he will exalt us. We're not called to exalt ourselves. We're called to humble ourselves in the presence of Jesus, and he will lift us up. So as you continue to study God's word and pray through it, I pray that you would just surrender yourself to the Spirit 
and just say, Jesus, help me to keep in step with your spirit this week. Help me to have a loving attitude towards those around me. Help me to build them up and not tear them down as I seek to point them towards my Savior, Jesus. That's what he wants us to say. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you once again for the power of your word. We thank you for Romans chapter 2. It's a lot. There's a lot here, more than I can uh, expound upon in just a short period of time. Lord, you know that. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would in even intervene in each person's heart and mind who's hearing this message, that you would illuminate them with the truth of your word, that you would set them free, Lord, from the law of sin and death. And if they have never repented of their sin and come to a place of trusting in you, Jesus, as their Savior, that today that would happen, right now as I'm praying that that would happen, that more and more people would come to faith in you and be a part of your church so that more and more people can find their mission uh, in the power of your spirit so that more and more people can hear the gospel and have their lives transformed. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us through your word and through your spirit. We pray that this next week we would faithfully live for you and continue to fight the good fight of the faith just like the Apostle Paul did. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. Thanks for connecting with our online service. Uh, we continue to pray for all of you who are at your homes and are trusting that you are well. Have a blessed week.